Please take your Bible and look with me once again in the book of James, James chapter 2. If you can remember that far back, I think we left off in the beginning of James chapter 2 back in November. And now I'm going to try to uh, finish James over the next couple of months. James chapter 2. I hope you listened well to Gary as he read Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. If you uh, recall any of what he read, the heart of it was Paul arguing that Abraham was justified not by works, but by faith. And now we're going to read a text that is going to say what appears to be the opposite. Listen to our text this evening, James 2, verse 14 through 26. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works. Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead dead. So Paul says, argues forcefully, that Abraham was not justified by works, but was justified by faith alone. James argues that Abraham was justified by works. And so those who, I would say, have a lower view of Scripture, will often pit James against Paul. Now, I have a view of Scripture that says that God is the one author, the one mind behind all of Scripture, that God has a coherent theology that agrees within itself. That when God chose Paul to write and chose James to write, that what they wrote is what God wanted them to write, and that it is not in contradiction. It is only a, an apparent co contradiction. Some would like us to think that James and Paul are two men in a sword fight. They are facing each other, their swords are drawn. Paul is fighting with his sword for justification by faith alone. James is fighting with his sword for justification by works and that they are battling to the death to see who is right. 
But I want to suggest, as one author has, that James and Paul are not facing each other with swords. Rather, they are back to back. They are facing enemies, and they are fighting with swords drawn, with gospel swords drawn, but they are fighting back to back. James is sort of looking past salvation. Paul is looking in the back toward those who are coming to salvation. They're both standing in Christ. They both believe in being justified by faith alone in Christ. But Paul has his sword drawn looking back against all of those who would say, in coming to Christ, in answering the question, how can I be accepted by God, I must earn it. I must work for it. And Paul is arguing, no, if you want to be in Christ, if you want to get in Christ, if you want union and salvation in Christ, then there's nothing you can do to help it. There's no merit in anything you do. It is by faith alone that you gain a standing of union in Christ, of acceptance by God. And so Paul's sword is drawn against all of those who say that you can in some way earn your own salvation or contribute to it in some way. But James is also standing in Christ. And he's looking at those who say, I am in Christ. I have faith in Christ. I believe in Jesus. And yet their lives are devoid of evidence. They're saying, I believe, but doesn't matter how I live, doesn't matter what I do, because I'm in Christ, I have faith. And James is saying, wait a minute, if you are in Christ, in union with Christ, sharing the life of Christ, then there's a necessary consequence of that faith. That true faith that plants you in Jesus Christ is a faith that works, that will be evident in work. James is, Paul is answering the question, how can I be justified before God? And his answer is, by faith alone. James is answering the question, how can I be justified? Not declared righteous, but how can I show, be shown to be in Christ? How can I show and, and, and make evident that I have real faith in Christ? James says, before men, you are justified by works because they can't see your faith. God can look into your heart and know that you're resting and trusting in and believing in and delighting in and being satisfied in Jesus Christ. But men can't look at my heart and see what I really believe, but they can look at my life. And so they're back-to-back -back fighting enemies of the gospel, one that, one that distorts the gospel by saying, I can add to it by my own merit, and the other that distorts the gospel by saying, all you need is a confession, all you need is words, all you need to do is say, I believe. And so they're not antagonists, they are fighting enemies of the gospel of Christ. You know, we live in a world where there are over two billion people who would say, I'm a Christian. Two billion. And if you ask many of them, what do you mean by that? Are you a Christian? Many of them would say, I am doing my best to please God. I go to church. I read my Bible. I, I'm doing my best to please God. Others might say on the other end of the spectrum, they might simply say, well, I believe in Jesus as my Savior. And Paul and James would agree that neither answer in and of itself is sufficient. 
Your answer should be something like this. Well, Paul would say to the first person, obedience to God can't create faith. To the person who says, I'm doing my best, Paul would say, so what does that mean? Lots of people are doing their best. Doing good works, even doing good Christian works, does not create the reality of saving faith. James would say to the second person who says, well, I believed. You know, I walked an aisle, I raised my hand, I prayed a prayer. James would say, if you have saving faith, then saving faith always creates a measure of obedience to God. Obedience cannot create saving faith, but saving faith will always create a measure of obedience to God. So again, Paul and James are not antagonists. They, were, they are fighting enemies of the gospel. Are you a Christian? If so, your answer should be something like this. I believe in Jesus Christ. I rely on him. I rest in his finished work. I confess him as Lord. I delight in, in him. I'm seeking my satisfaction in him. And the consequence of that is I seek to live a life of obedience under his lordship. If you're a Christian, it's not simply I believe. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I follow Jesus. I'm seeking to live under his lordship. But at the same time, I rest in him. I rely on him. I believe in him. I delight in him. I find my satisfaction in Jesus Christ. So James's argument is simply this. Genuine faith always produces a measure of acceptable obedience to God. Genuine faith always produces obedience to God. It's never perfect obedience, but it will produce obedience. Notice in verse 15, his first argument, and his argument is basically this. If you have faith, then it will be demonstrated in how you treat your brother and sister. And James is saying something that John said in a different way. The Apostle John said, if you love your brother, then you will meet his needs. If you really know God, you will love your brother and meet his needs. John says, if you see that your brother has a need and you shut up your compassion toward him, how does the love of God dwell in you. John is saying you can't really love God if you don't love your brothers and sisters in Christ. You can't simply say to them, God bless you, I'll pray for you, and let them go, go away without their need being met when it's in your capacity to meet it. Well, James says something similar, only he doesn't use the word love. He uses the word faith. He says if a brother or sister is poorly clothed, then and lacking in daily food. And here I prefer some of the older translations or even the NIV in this place uh, because they use stronger words, which I think is what the Greek indicates. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food. So James is picturing... Uh, painting a picture of a really horrendous situation. That here's somebody, it's not just somebody who's fully dressed, who looks healthy, and who's begging on the sidewalk. Now this is somebody who's naked and destitute. They have nothing. And more than that, it's your brother or your sister in Jesus Christ. And you say, God bless you, I'll pray for you. And you go home and eat a big meal and throw the leftovers in the trash. James says there's something deficient about your faith. 
There's something wrong with how you think you believe in Jesus Christ. Or as he said earlier when he was talking about how they treated the rich and the poor when they came into the assembly. You know, how do you hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory? How do you hold that faith and say you have that faith when you can say to a rich man, sit here, and to a poor man, you ignore him? How do you say you're a believer when you don't care about your brother and sister in Christ? He says, what good is that faith? What good are words? God bless you, brother. And I'm sure I've been guilty of it myself. It's much easier to say, I'll pray for you, than to ask myself, how can I help you? And maybe even sacrifice to help meet that need in, in your life. James is telling us that callousness to the, toward the needs of your brothers and sisters in Christ is indicative that there's something desperately wrong with your faith. There's something spurious about it. There's something doubtful about it. He says that faith is dead. It's not saving faith. It's useless. It's dead. It's just words. Stories told of a young boy who was on an errand for his mother. He had just bought a, a, a dozen eggs. And when he was walking out of the store, he tripped and dropped the sack of eggs, and all the eggs broke on the sidewalk. The boy tried not to cry. A few people gathered to see if he was okay, to tell him how sorry they were that uh, this had happened. But in the midst of all of the expressions of pity, one man handed the boy a quarter. And then he turned to the rest of the people that were there and he said, I care 25 cents worth. How much do the rest of you care? How much do you care? Only enough to say, I feel bad for you. I'll pray for you. James isn't asking how much do you care. James is asking, do you really believe in Jesus? Do you really rest in him and rely on him? and trust in him, and find your delight in him, and your satisfaction in him in such a way that it's created in you a new heart that is compassionate toward your brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you have that kind of faith? Genuine faith shows its reality by producing obedience to God. Faith by itself, if it does not have works, it is dead. Faith that is outwardly inoperative is inwardly dead. It is simply a recitation of a confession of faith, but it is not a faith that means that you have union with Christ in such a way that his life is your life and transforming your life. And to know that James and Paul don't really contradict each other, that both of them believe in the necessity of good works as an expression of genuine faith, you just read the writings of Paul. Because Paul will tell you, it's by grace you're saved through faith. And that's not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that you should walk in them. Both James and Paul believe that it's genuine faith 
that brings you into union with the living God, that, that, that brings you into acceptance with the living God. But a genuine faith will always issue forth in good works. Paul put it this way to Titus, the young pastor. He said, this is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good obedience to God. If you're believed in God, you say, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior, then there's something within you that says, I want to live a life of good obedience to God. Not because I'm getting salvation, but because I am in Christ. I have salvation. His life is in me. His second argument is similar Genuine faith is more than just mental assent or verbal assent. And here in verse uh, 18, he hypothetically calls in a third person into the conversation. So the per third person is standing there looking at James and looking at the one who's claiming to have faith but doesn't have works. And he looks at the one and he says, you, James is saying, this man is saying, you have faith. And he's saying, I have works. But I'm saying, show me your faith apart from your works. And I will show you my faith by my works. You believe in God? That's good. But you should know that the demons believe in God. And they tremble at that thought. They're affected by it. Not in some saving way, but they're affected by that belief. While you say you believe in God and you're unaffected by it. Yes, it's possible to believe all the right things and be unaffected by it. You know, when Peter got up and preached on the day of Pentecost, he preached that this Christ had risen from the dead, and the hearts of the, and consciences of the people were pricked that day by the Holy Spirit, and, and they asked, what should we do? And he said, repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized. What did they do that day? They got baptized. They became part of the church. They continued in the apostles' teaching. They prayed together. They shared their goods. They shared the gospel with others. There was an effect uh, in their life, a consequence in their life of, of, of believing in Jesus Christ. Now, don't make the mistake that you can sort of reverse it. That being baptized and becoming part of a church and learning the Bible and praying and giving and witnessing can somehow create real faith. There are lots of people who do lots of the right things but still don't have faith. That's not James's argument. James isn't, isn't saying work a little bit harder to bring about real faith in your life. No, James is simply saying if you have real faith, then it shows itself in obedience. Last night I listened to the testimony of a man share how he came to know Christ. And as I listened to him, I've heard similar testimonies many times. And he was saying that, you know, at some point in his life he heard the gospel, heard a hellfire brimstone message, and was aware and fearful that he was going to hell, and he uh, asked Jesus to save him. And from that day on, he knew that he wasn't going to hell. But it really didn't change his life. There was a time later in his life when he got serious about serving Christ. It didn't change his life. It didn't keep him from wanting to follow some of the passions of his heart and live, uh, li live a worldly life. But 
in his mind, he had escaped hell because he had asked Jesus to save him. I think James would say to him, that first faith you had, though you might have thought it was saving faith, really wasn't saving faith. Because saving faith that doesn't issue forth in some measure of obedience to God, faith, an expression of faith that doesn't bring about obedience, is not saving faith. It's just a confession. I had that confession. Maybe some of you did. I was probably junior high, maybe early teens, when I asked Jesus to save me and got baptized. Didn't make any difference to what was going on in my heart. I still loved John Davis more than I loved Jesus, and I still loved sin more than I loved righteousness. It made no difference. If you would have asked me, am I a Christian? I would have said, yeah, I believe in Jesus. But when I was 19 and heard the gospel again, and God was doing a deep work of conviction in my heart and brought me to repentance and the kind of faith that resulted in a love for Christ and a desire to know him and to live for him, I can say that in September of 1970, I knew what saving faith was all about. As a young person, I knew what it was to believe. To have a faith that was, as James would say, useless. That faith cannot save. It's dead. It's simply a belief. Which is what many Christians and professing Christians in this world have. A little bit later in the service, we'll say the Apostles' Creed. I love the Apostles' Creed. When I say it, I always want to say it with thoughtfulness and deep conviction that this is something I really believe. I don't ever want to just recite it because this is something we do. I always want to think about it and think about those words and claim them and say, this is mine. And yet I know it's very possible to do Christian rituals and Christian things and not be a Christian. And that's James's argument. You say that you have faith. Show me. Show me by your obedience to God that there's something real within you. Because I'll show you, he said. Follow me around. You'll see that James is not the same James before he confessed faith in his half-brother who he came to believe was Jesus, the Son of God. I'll show you my faith by my works. Mental assent is good and it's necessary. It's necessary to have the right theology, the right content of your faith. But demons have good theology, but no salvation. His third point is this. Genuine faith is known both to God and to men. That is, if you have saving faith, God knows it, and others can see evidence of it. Others can't really determine whether or not your, what's going on in your heart is real. But they can at least look at your life and say, there's evidence, there's reason to believe that you are a Christian. James's concern is not, and this is where we get on the subject of what it means to be justified. There are people like N.T. Wright, a very popular uh, Anglican theologian, and very similarly, the Roman Catholic Church that would say that you really have to wait until the final judgment to find out whether you are fully justified before God. That your works throughout your life will be judged in the final day and they will determine your final justification. Did you really have a life 
that belonged to Jesus. Now, I've got a lot of problems with that, but one of the main ones is God doesn't need to wait till tomorrow to find out if you're real today. He doesn't need to wait until the final judgment to know, to determine whether or not uh, you are righteous enough for heaven. There's a couple of reasons for that, but the main reason is if you are in Christ, he's already made that declaration. Paul put it this way, therefore having been justified by faith. Paul says this is a done deal. Having been justified, it's over, it's done. We now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God doesn't have to follow you around to see if you're really a Christian. Although, let me say, God does follow you around. There's nothing in your life that escapes his notice. But he doesn't follow around to see if you have genuine faith. He knows by looking into your heart. He knows that because he brought it about. He made it possible. He brought you under conviction. He brought the gospel to you. He's the one who ultimately made you alive. He brought you into union with Jesus Christ. God did all of this. He's not waiting for some final justification. So when James is talking about being justified, he's not being, talking about being justified before God. God already knows whether or not you are in Christ or not. James's concern is that others might see evidence of your confession of faith. If you're a Christian, you do make a confession of faith. You make a confession that says, in Christ I am righteous already. I am accepted. I am forgiven. I belong to God forever. You make that confession. That's what Christianity is. It says that I am saved in Christ. But if nothing follows that, if all they hear is talk, words, but never see a life that's transformed, then in the minds of the world, there's nothing about you that justifies your confession of faith. And so he uses two illustrations. It's interesting, he uses the illustration of the one who is sort of the prototype of all of those who are, are declared righteous by faith. Abraham, Genesis 15, 6, believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Abraham is the first of whom it's clearly said in a moment, just because of his faith in God's word, God declared him righteous. But James doesn't simply look at that instance, though he does mention it. He's not looking at the instance when Abraham was accepted by God. He's looking at an instance in his life when others could see and hear and know of the faith of Abraham and say, this man is a friend of God. This man really knows God. This man really loves God. Because James says Abraham was justified by his works, not in the eyes of God, but in the eyes of those who knew him. He was justified by his works when he obeyed God in that difficult act of obedience, of being willing to offer his son as a sacrifice. Then they could say, yes, he's a friend of God. They couldn't look at his heart. They couldn't know, they couldn't look inside and know that God had declared this man righteous on the basis of faith. But they could see by his obedience to God that truly this is a man that loves God, who gives evidence of being in relationship with God. Interestingly, James picks from what we might say, humanly speaking, the top of the barrel and the bottom of the barrel. Because Abraham is one of those men who seems to, even apart from uh, being justified by faith, there's so much about him. He's 
rich, he's wealthy, he's religious, he's, you know, there, 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 there's so much attractive about this man, Abraham. And then there's Rahab. She's a prostitute. She's a non-Jew prostitute. And James says she was justified by works. That is, she showed that she really believed in the God of Israel because she had made that confession. She had heard of all that he had done. She had come to believe that he was the true God. But there were just words. How did the Israelites know that this this prostitute is one who really has come to faith in God? James says, by her works, she was justified in the eyes of the Israelites because she hid the spies. She protected. She loved the people of God. Now, when I look at this this text and ask myself, what is... What is James trying to get us to do? When he's probing our works and probing and maybe questioning our faith, what is he saying to you? Is he saying on one hand, examine your works. Examine them, look at your obedience, and when you find that it doesn't measure up, It's deficient, deficient, work harder. Is that James's message? That if you're going to have real faith, you got to work harder to get it. Become more religious, become more faithful, become more obedient. Is that James's appeal or is his appeal this? Examine your works. Because I like to ask people, Two questions. You know, first, I want to know, are you a Christian? Yeah. Do you confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? And then I want to ask them, what is there in your life today that demonstrates that that confession is real? Because I meet people all the time who say, I'm a Christian, They don't go to church. They don't read their Bible. They don't pray. They live just like anybody else does. There's no obedience to God in their life. So it is legitimate for us to examine our works. Paul says, examine yourself. Even when we come to the Lord's table, we examine ourselves. So we examine our work And when found deficient, it's not work harder, it's examine my faith. When I examine my life and my my conclusion is there's something wrong with my obedience, there's something wrong with what I'm doing, the, the cure isn't to work harder, the cure is to go back and ask what's wrong with my faith. Am I trusting in Jesus? Am I relying on Jesus? Am I resting in Jesus? Am I finding my delight in Christ? Am I seeking my satisfaction in Christ? Because this should become characteristic of our life, and when it is characteristic of our life, then obedience comes forth. James isn't saying work harder. James is saying look at the genuineness of your faith. You can can perform and obey and put forth all of the effort you can to obey God, but it'll never create a genuine faith. But you can sit down and ask God for grace because it's by grace that you're saved through faith, and that's not of yourself. Faith isn't even something we muster up on our own. 
It's seeking God's grace to keep looking to Christ. This is how I know I'm a believer, because of what's going on in my heart, not always what's going on in my life. There's something in my heart that says I want to trust Christ. I want to rely on him. I want to rest in him. I want to delight in him. I want to find my satisfaction in him. As we talked yesterday at the men's Bible study, we talked a little bit about the discipline of faith. It's not only that I believed in Jesus, but whom, having not seen, we love, whom though now we see him not, Yet believing, constantly believing. If my work is deficient, I don't need to work harder. I need to find my faith rooted again in the wonder and beauty of who Christ is and what he's done. I need to fall in love with Jesus Christ all over again. And when my faith is right, I will choose with joy the obedience God has for me in life. Let's pray together, shall we? And Father, we do ask for grace. Grace that would nurture in all of us a deeper, more stable, focused faith in Jesus Christ, that we might keep believing, that we might keep relying on him, that we might keep resting in him and keep seeking our delight and our satisfaction in him. God, give us grace to nurture the discipline of faith. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.